Would you please welcome Ron Butlin, Liz Lockhead, Andrew Gegg, and Brian McCabe, the Lost Poets fan. you on a Thursday I was feeling so low Ain't got much money Got no place to go But your big smile You took my poor heart away And just for a while You could hear me say yeah Hear me say, I like you, baby. I'm coming around to you. What's that you say? You like me too, but your big smile, you too. What did I do to find someone like you? Was I so good to make you turn your head my way? What can I do? on first. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Um, I'm going to do uh, two or three poems from uh, a group I wrote called, uh, that I called Low Life. They're all about fairly humble creatures. Um, partly it was a bit difficult to find creatures that Norman McCaig hadn't already covered in Edinburgh to write about. And, um, but uh, also just uh, had an interest in uh, insect life at the time and uh, snugs, slugs and snails and things. Uh, this one is called Eel, and um, I was quite impressed reading about eels and, um, you know, and with my encounters with eels as well, at how, how much of a 
surviving, a survivalist creature, uh, Anil is, and um, they have this massive um, migration to the Sargasso Sea to mate and, uh, and things like that. So um, it, 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 the, the eel speaking in the poem is the one who's kind of trying to get the migration organized. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. We have come so far together to reach the mouth of this river. Now it's time to turn silver and black. You can probably feel the salt water changing the function of your kidneys. This is normal. If we stay together now, we can describe a wide arc between Bermuda and Puerto Rico till we come to our birthplace where the currents are sluggish and the seaweed is dense. The perfect place to mate, spawn, and die. First, we have to get there. The sea is deep and dangerous. Don't trust anybody, even your own swallower and gulper cousins. When those guys need to eat, all they do is open their mouths and swim. This advice comes from our ancestral memory. Trust in your sense of smell. Stay elusive and keep in line. Okay, on with the migration. If anybody asks who we are, tell them we're snakes that swim and we take forever to kill. Let's go to the Sargasso. There are sort of about people as well, these poems. Um, and this last one is uh, called Seagull. And I was lying awake in bed one early one morning and I heard the seagulls coming in from the coast to descend uh, on the meadows in Edinburgh. And I think it was the first, the first time they really came in and, and they've been living here ever since. And um, actually a friend of mine blamed me. He said, it's your fault you wrote that poem about them. Now they, now they won't go away. So seagull. We are the dawn marauders. We prey on pizza. We kill kebabs. We mug thrushes for bread crusts with a snap of our big bent beaks. We drum the worms from the ground with a stamp of our wide webbed feet. We spread out, cover the area like cops looking for the body of a murdered fish supper. Here we go with our hooligan yells, loud with gluttony, sharp with starvation. Here we go bungee jumping on the wind, charging from the cold sea of our birth. This is invasion. This is occupation. Our flags are black, white, and gray. Our wing stripes are our rank. No sun can match the brazen color of our mad yellow eyes. We are the seagulls. We are the people. Thank you. Ah, oh, good evening, everyone. I'm really pleased to see so many people. I was wondering what poem I could start with, you know, to sort of celebrate the reunion that it is for us. Liz very kindly asked if I could slip in a poem in Scots. Uh, when we when we started well, all these years ago. Um, I went through quite a long period of writing in Scots, and if nothing else, this is the only um, kind of epitaph to Jimi Hendrix in Scots. In memoriam, Jimi Hendrix. Hodden the breeds and hecht to the universe, the deal at his right hand, God at his left. His fingers were groping among stars for the sickless quasars that boomed inside his head. Yen minute ran a lifespan and back and his horns thrummled with the years. Yen weirdless keek and the world count. And we are left whispering to yourselves who yince the planet circled us. And I'll finish uh, my set with a, um, a bit slightly longer poem. It's called The Electric City of Heck. Heck is a village down in the borders where um, my wife and I bought a derelict cottage once and tried to make it into a kind of home, but it was so derelict that eventually it beat us. 
And it starts with a very highly poetical look into the past. The electric city of Heck. Cattle stumbling their way down to the shallows, etc. Sunlight slanting through the autumn woods, etc., 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 etc. Isn't it time I trashed such childhood fancies? After all, I live in the electric city, and the electric city lives in me. My pulse is a traffic stop and go and what I know of love and friendship names the only streets I care for. So, how come I keep helter-skeltering back to where? And for what? To try to give our sorry planet a pastoral makeover to scythe down fields of finance, CEOs, corporate heads and lying politicians row upon sleek row, bailed and stacked, ready to be recycled into something useful. Hardly. And yet, Almost overnight, our city life's been digitized, uploaded to a, an encrypted site. Its inhabitants given new usernames, new passwords. Our histories are deleted at a mouse click. Everyone's now making up the truth. And beneath a touchscreen sky of urban stars, we continue our separate journeys from the very center of the universe, where all our journeys start from, especially the most personal. The name for our loneliness is self, and we live for moments of recognition, brief communion. Accelerating away from the Lockerbie bombing, the Twin Towers, while keeping ourselves well ahead of the next atrocity. Gaza, Syria, Iran, Afghanistan, the melting ice caps, wildfires, droughts and famines are parked in a lay-by for the time being. And with luck, a tow truck might be on its way. Same road, same destination. Still en route to where we're always making for. You, me, and the fond memories we rely on. Like outdated maps. Or else, should I return to that summer's afternoon? Rebrand it the electric city of heck. Hashtag solid ground. Reformat it for the 21st century into a glass cathedral that promises unlimited face time between man and his God of choice. Or into a newfound glacier that will cool us down. Into an ocean cleansed to offer us all a second chance. And meanwhile... Let's take the best of what we have and the best of what we are. Let's reconfigure a streamlined rush of, of swifts that eat, sleep and mate on the wing, never touching the earth from here to Africa. Not angels, but our guides into a trackless future. Our guides our inspiration. Thank you. Okay. We're now going to have a song from Jim and the band who uh, used to change their personnel and their name regularly from gig to gig in the old days, but he tells me they're now called the Slider Twins, even though there are three of them. So, Slider, Slider Twins. This uh, song was written by a guy called Roland Sally. Called Killing the Blues. Leaves were falling just like embers. In colors red and gold, they set us on fire. Burning just like a moon. Bye. 
Daddy said they saw me Swinging the world by his tail Bouncing over a white cloud Kid in the blue I am guilty of something I hope you never do Because there is nothing Sadder than losing yourself in love Somebody said they saw me Swinging the world by his tail Bouncing over a white cloud Killing the blue to find what I've already had Somebody said they saw me Swinging the world by this tail Bouncing over a white cloud Killing the blue Somebody said they saw Bouncing over a white cloud Killing the blues Thank you very much. Andrew Gregg. When I was a child, we used to drive over to see my grandparents over Carter Bar, and that meant driving through the dark, and I was entranced by watching the cat's eyes come out of the dark. But I really truly believed that there were cats buried up to their necks. <laughs> I was a sensitive child, and over-imaginative. Um, and I still kind of wince when I drive over one. But so this poem is a man is driving, and it's basically existentialism for beginners. A man is driving on a road that ends, sure as fate and chance conspire in a precipice. That's life. But he don't know where, and he don't know when. For this road's one long driving round a bend, where what's concealed becomes revealed only in the moment he's in. And what's revealed becomes concealed by the continuing turn behind him. Turn any corner at any time of any day, and your trail may end in the dreamfall, where you never wake because this time you hit bottom. And this hitchhiker with the future in her thumb may be your death or your next loved one. And this is the code of the road that we groove on, as day and night on the jeweled carriageway, wheel and white line embrace like lovers, each utterly justifying the other. Whatever highway we unroll tonight, whoever's passenger I am, the cat's eyes come alive as I pass by and stare into me, unwinking, calm. As out of the dark they swing and back into the dark they fade, I am not afraid, for we are a travelling light and we spark in the moment we're in. First concert I ever went to, uh, aged 11, was Jimmy Shand in Stirling. 
The second concert I went to in 1968 was the Incredible String Band, which was a very different kettle of fish. But they're both profoundly, profoundly Scottish. Jimmy Shan didn't really believe in smiling. He made Van Morrison seem like a ray of sunshine. <laughs> but he swung. That man played. So I will end up writing, writing four poems um, for and about Jimmy Shand. The Pits. Yon was music making Scottish style, a serious business and damned hard work. The accordion bulged like a chest expander across the hidden muscle of his heart. His polkas were gales trapped in a box. Kilted to the gills, horn specks black as coal from the mines he went down at 14, Shand gave it loudly, staring straight ahead, unsmiling, fingers blurred, only movement, his left heel kicking out the beat. There's nothing free about expression. He learned that well from earliest days. Whatever joy there was in it for him laboured as his father had, deep down. This is the third poem. Jimmy Shand was very dry. At the Brechin B&B, he requested honey with his toast. The dual landlady brought a tiny pot. He inspected it. Hmm, I see you keep a bee. <laughs> very. <laughs> he, li he lived for his work, and his work was music. Carnegie Hall Dunfermline or Carnegie Hall New York, no odds. He named tune, time signature, and played it. His audience sat as though at prayer, heads bowed, sucking sweeties, silently nodding along to their maker. That hall was crammed with joy, minutely expressed. The compression of his mouth set off the hoot of his reels, jigs, strass bays. They rightly named a locomotive after him. Which they did. I never completed all the Scottish Munros. I left about 30 undone. I'm surprised I'm not more upset about that. Um, I'm never going to do it now. They give me many wonderful days, and, and here's one of them, with a little help from the magic band to sprinkle a little dust on it. This is uh, Neudart Revisited. The little boat across Loch Huon skittered on the shingle. We stepped ashore, late May in my life. She went to Larven with our friends, and I had Lunaven to myself, sun on shoulders all the way. Few details remain, but a sense of hours of solitude and strength. The hill was there to lift me up. No false top, I wish there had been. Sweet with sweat and surf and ptarmigan, that ridge could have risen all afternoon. At the cairn I thought to her, on her own summit, loving it, loving me by line of sight. I set off down, exultant. Each step flowed into the next, Joltless, as though hill and the hip were one. We met up at Barrasdale, full of our day. Years later, we parted. Dear companion, there are some hills and people we cannot return to because nothing would be the same, because we never left them. Ye go, lassie, go. Will ye go, lassie, go? Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, this is a, 
a love poem about golf or a golf poem about enduring love. It's called A a Long Shot. I hope I can still remember it because I didn't bring it with me. (laughs) When your lover on waking recounts her dreams, unruly, striking, unfathomable as herself, your attention wanders to her moving lips, throat, those slim shoulders draped in a shawl of light. And what's happening here is not what's said, but who is saying it. The overwhelming fact she lives and breathes beside you another day. Other folks' golf shots, being even less interesting than their dreams, I'll be brief. As she spoke, I thought of a putt yesterday at the fourth, as many feet from the pin as I am years from my birth, many more than I am from my death. One stiff clip, it burled across the green, swung up the hill, curved down the dale like a miniature planet heading home. And the strangest thing is not what's going to happen, but your dazed, incredulous knowing it will, long before the ball reaches the cup, then drops, that it's turned out right after all like waking one morning to find yourself unerringly in love with your wife. Thank you very much. (laughs) So, thank you. Now we've got Liz. The boy is ten, and today it is his birthday. Behind him on the lawn, his mother and his little sister unfurl a rainbow crayoned big and bright on a roll of old wallpaper. His father, big-eyed, mock solemn, pantomimes ceremony as he lights the ten candles on the cake. Inside her living room, his grandmother puts her open palm to the window. Out in the garden, her grandson reaches up, mirrors her, stretching fingers, and they smile and smile as if they touched warm flesh, not cold glass. More than 40,000 years ago, men or women splayed their fingers thus and put their hands to bare rock. They chewed ochre, red ochre, gritted charcoal, and blue, blue with projectile effort that really took it out of them, their living breath. Raw gouts of pigment spattered the living stencil that was each his own living hand and made their mark. The space of absence was the clean, stark picture of their presence. And it pleased them. We do not know why they did it, and maybe they did not know either, but they knew they must. It was the cold cave wall and they knew they were up against it. The birthday boy is juggling. He's been spending time in the lockdown learning, but though he still can't keep it up for long, his grandmother dumb shows most extravagant applause. She toasts them all in tea from her best granny in the world mug, winking and linking her lips ecstatically as they cut the cake, miming hunger, miming prayer for her hunger to be sated. The slim girl dances and her grandmother claps and claps again, blinking tears. Another matched high five at her window. Neither the blown candles or the blown kisses will leave any permanent mark unless love does on them. On this The only afternoon they will be all alive together on just this day, the boy is 10. One of my favorite fairy stories, everybody's Beauty and the Beast, where beauty can redeem the beast. But we all know that with love affairs, it can go the other way. We can find that um, the beast could maybe um, uh, corrupt beauty. So... This is a poem about just that. Beauty and the beast. He was hot, he grew horns. He had you screaming, mommy, daddy, screaming, blue murder. From one sleepy thought of 
how like a mane his hair. Next thing he's furred and feathered, pig bristled, warted like a toad, puffed and jumping. The green cling of those froggy fingers will make you shudder yet. Then his flesh gone dead, scaled as a handbag. He was that old crocodile you had to kiss. Yes, Rosebud, I suppose you were right. Better than hanging around a hundred years for someone to hack his way through the thorns, for the shoe that fits, for chance to have you cough up that poisoned apple wedged in your gullet so you, anything for a quiet life, embrace the beast, endure. Three days and nights, three patient years, you'll win, I'm sure, but who'd have guessed paying your dues would mean the whole wham-ban menagerie? Oh, but soon her hair grew lang, her breath grew strang. You'll, little one eye for little three eyes, the bearded lady. Yes, sweet beauty, you'll match him, horror for horror. <coughs> Yeah, we're now, now going to uh, attempt my, with my horns, my wings, and my stabilizer things, and it goes something like this. I can live, I can love, I can push, I can shove with my horns, my wings, and my stabilizer things. I can laugh, I can cry, I can why, why, why With, with my horns and my wings and my stabilizer things I can beg it, I can jig it, I can dig, dig, dig it With my horns, my wings and my stabilizer things I can live, I can die, I can dot my eye With my horns and my wings and my stabilizer things I can laugh, I can frown, turn the tortoise upside down. With my horns and my wings and my stabilizer things. I can love, I can hate, I can exfoliate. With my With horns, my horns and, and my wings, wings and my stabilizer things. Je peux lire, je peux dire, je peux mourir Avec mes cordes, mes ailes et mes choses stabilisées <laughs> Je peux croire, je peux boire, je peux dire bête noire Avec mes cornes, mes ailes, mes choses stabilisées Je peux danser mes enfants, je pense, pense, pense Avec mes cornes, mes ailes et mes choses stabilisées I can riddle, I can rhyme, I can... Bide my time with my horns and my wings and my stabilizer things. I can listen, I can tell, I can well, well, well with my horns and my wings and my stabilizer things. I can raise, I can blame, I can share your pain with my horns and my wings and my stabilizer things. With my horns and my wings and my stabilizer things. Well, I used to live on Broadway Right next to the Lyons house my number was self-confidence Very little guide of mine So I moved, yeah, I moved And I made it in a straight street now Yeah, I moved And I made it in a straight street now Over 
Let me tell you how it was with me Well, Satan had me in his chains I had no liberty One day my heart got troubled About my dwelling place And I heard the Lord when he spoke to me You gotta get out of that place So I moved, yeah, I moved Street now, yeah, I move, and I'm living in a straight street Since I moved, I'm really living I got peace within And I thank the Lord for everything So glad I found you friends So I moved, yeah, I moved And I'm living in a straight street now Yeah, I moved And I'm living in a straight street now Yeah, Street now, yeah, I moved, and I'm living in a straight street now. Okay, um, I'm going to start my second set with the only confessional poem I've ever written, or the only confessional poem that I'm willing to admit to having written. It's called Stone. Of all the stones I threw as a boy, I remember only one. Unlike stones I flicked and skipped to interrupt flat water, bullet stones to detonate bottles, ding tin cans from high fences, unlike stones thrown at headstones to exercise the dead, unlike stones thrown out of boredom at dogs, cats, fish, birds, rats, just to keep them on their toes, this particular stone was thrown so all my sins confess themselves at last as a girl. And when I watched it swoop from the air, I shut my eyes tight, aware that I'd get what I deserved and more. I was guilty, yet in that moment I learned to care for another, for her suffering. So love's aim was as true as mine, and all its longing came down on me, came down on me and cut me through. And um, this poem, uh, when my youngest daughter was at school, at, at primary school, she, uh, she fell over in the playground and uh, banged her head uh, on the concrete. And um, the school called me up and uh, got me to come in and take her to the sick children's hospital. And uh, she was fine, she was fine. But, um, when the doctor, they had to do an x-ray of her skull, and when the doctor was showing me the x-ray, uh, she, she grabbed the x-ray from him and ran away with it down the ward. And, um, and I ran after her and said, you've got to give that to, to the doctor, you know. And she said, no, it's mine. And, well, in a way she was right, it was her skull, you know. The x-ray of my daughter's skull is vast. This moth with its dark wings of smoke 
is a map of the undiscovered world. Continents part, seas come together, and dark lands bear no legend. I speak to her one to one, though our scales are different. The giant I am in her land lumbers in murmured words that boom in her head like bombs. Then I'm gullivered, tethered by a smile from her Lilliputian lips as she snatches the acetate shadow of her precious skull from my hands and claims it as her own. I'm, I'm going to um, end with a couple of poems from my last book, which is called Zero, and um, all of the poems were about um, uh, numbers or mathematics in one form or another. And, you know, I got interested in this for the first time in my life, um, mainly through thinking about how I was taught how to count at infant school. And um, we were taught using... Um, kind of counters, colored counters, uh, which we placed on um, pieces of cardboard, a bit like dominoes. And that made me go to the library, uh, to the mathematics section for the first time in my life. And I saw, I came home with all these books about chaos theory and all sorts of other things. So I'll read the, the poem that kind of initiated uh, the whole thing. It's called Counters. Tiddly winked into the inkwell, that thimble of pale enamel, like an egg shell nesting in an ancient wooden eye. They were the counters, and we counted them. One, two, three. But who was this cross-legged abstraction? Four. We added them into a column which leaned towards infinity before it skilled, spilled and scattered its random pattern on the floor. Soon they'd have us lined up in columns, human logarithms, chanting an ugly prayer to the god of multiplication. The chaos we came from would always be there, whatever was done with the counters, those bright buttons of color we placed on our tongues to taste the smoothness, the thinness of one. And um, another thing that I remembered from that time, uh, was a, a rhyme we, were, we had to chant in the class um, called One Man Went to Mo. Some of you of my generation might remember the same, the same thing. And uh, just thinking about that later, <clears throat> it just seemed very weird to me, this whole class of children chanting like a form of indoctrination or something almost. Anyway, um, I wrote this poem about it called Mo. All those men who went to mow, went to mow a meadow. Were they mad? <laughs> Had nobody told them that their job was pointless, that the meadow was endless? One thing is clear, they did not go by choice. They went because they were sent. Maybe it's no co coincidence that the place they mow in was called mow. No doubt it was named after its reputation, all that mowing, day and night, never ending. The problem is the grass keeps on growing and growing, and the owner despises daisies. And so one man, deafened by lawnmowers, shouts to his dog, I've had enough, let's go. Then two men, the two who followed him to mow, stop, wipe their brows and go. Three men, four men, five men. Very soon there is an exodus of men from the meadow. Before leaving, the dog cocks his leg at the infinite and pisses a zero in the grass. <laughs> I'll finish with this one called The Romans, which, in which I, I imagined uh, the Roman numeral counting system being um, invented in... Little Italy somewhere in New Jersey by someone a bit like um, uh, Tony Soprano. The Romans. Listen up. This is how we're about to count from now on. We got a one, I. We got a five, V. We got a 10, X. We got a 50, L. We got a 100, C. We got a 500, D. 
also plus we got a thousand M. That's it. That's all we need. The fuck with dealing our letters to two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, eleven, twelve, thirteen, etc. Those motherfuckers can go eat shit. The rule is you add the little fish if it comes after the big fish because the big fish eats it, right? When the little fish comes before the big fish, you take it away on account of the big fish ain't ate it yet, okay? Any questions? <laughs> what do you mean, how'd you write 164? Am I talking to myself here? C L X I V, dumb fuck. <laughs> this means Tony the scribe only needs to know seven letters to run any number we tell him. Okay, let's go eat Chinese. <laughs> Can you that? Now we've got Ron. Right, um, we all started as poets, and we still write poetry, but um, we've gone on to, if you don't live long if you just write poetry, believe me, you need to eat. And so I thought um, I would read a, a short story. It's called Not Yet Dead Yet, Lily. And it's about self-empowerment, but in a very unusual way. With the approach of the thunderstorm, Lily was growing more and more restless. As the air became clammier and heavier, every breath stuck in her lungs. Outside, the sky had dark, darkened to blue-black. The window was open, but no draught came in. Four in the afternoon. Midsummer almost, dark enough indoors to have to switch on the light. Oh, but she wouldn't. Instead, having struggled to her feet, she stood in the airless front room, listening to herself gasp for breath. Oh, she better wait a moment before setting off to the kitchen for a drink of water. She didn't want to have the likes of Mrs. MacDonald come in and find her keeled over at last. Oh, sometimes it felt as if the whole street was just waiting for her to go. All those neighborly visits about nothing in particular except to check she'd not died in her sleep. Well, they were being very kind and she supposed she was grateful, but there was always the unspoken pause. The split second refocusing of a glance that betrayed the real question, not Dead yet, Lily? Well, she appreciated their concern, but fuck them. <laughs> yes, that was the only language to use in the last few weeks. Lily had discovered the relish of bad language. One morning, after she'd been woken by Mrs. Miller phoning to ask after the not dead yet pause if she wanted something from the shop. She'd said no, hung up, and now for breakfast. Oh, breakfast, bloody breakfast. She pulled on her dressing gown and started muttering to herself. Bloody breakfast. Bloody, 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 bloody breakfast. Oh, it felt good. It was stimulating. It was like a vigorous marching tune in her head. There she stood in front of the mirror, a kindly looking white-haired elderly woman, frail but dignified. No doubt the sort of words her neighbours used when talking about her. And all the time, behind the benevolent smile, she was hammering out full force, bloody, 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 bloody breakfast. And she grinned to herself. And she'd not done that in months. In a short time, the bloodies had given way to hells. And the hells to dams. But getting into fucks had been her big breakthrough. It was after the postman went by a couple of late days ago. No letters? Well, fuck him, she thought. <laughs> and then announced, fuck him, fuck him, fuck him. To the clock, the empty armchair and a whole clutch of wedding photographs. Stopping herself in time from getting too loud. Not because it might shock the McDonald's or the Millers or whoever might be passing. She didn't care about them. It was simply... She didn't really want to share these words with anyone. 
coming from her, they were hers. They were hers alone. Oh, but her words weren't working today. Fucking storm, fucking storm. She kept repeating as she stood at the kitchen, letting the tap run for coolness. But didn't feel any better. The water tasted heavy and tepid. She'd go into the garden. Sky was much blacker than before. Everything beneath gripped in sharp, shadowless light in the air. So sluggish, she almost had to push her way through it. Nothing seemed to move out here. Across the street, she could see the McDonald's. A group of stuffed figures crouched in a family circle around their patio table. Who were the McDonald's? Who were the Millers? Where had they come from? Where had any of the people in the street come from with their track seats and trainers and Twitters and tweets? The heaviness in the air seemed to have turned the bush by her front gate completely rigid. She gave one of the branches a tug and it shook, she could tell, unwillingly. Her brand new her neighbor's brand new spade was propped just within reach and without thinking what she was doing she picked it up its metal edge clanged against the stone path a, a clang that seemed to fill the street too bad she clanged it once more and her reward was five McDonald faces panned in her direction as she leant towards the bush, the bush, its perfume stuck in her skin. And in its sultriness, the scent seemed almost solid. Perhaps the air being so still, if she removed the plant and its scent, she could fit herself into the gap left behind and withdraw from a world filled with strangers bringing their strange ways. She started spading out earth. Not so hard, really, but with every thrust and lift, she had to stop, catch her breath. There was sweat trickling down her face and her back. She paused for a moment to wipe her eyes, clear, oh, and there, up on her hind legs were a couple of McDonald's staring over at her. And the bigger of them, a wobble of pink flesh, baldness and glasses, was already starting in her direction. She carried on digging. Not that she could remember what the plant was called or well, what anything was much was called these days. Only some things were alive and some weren't. One good tug and she'd have it free. The wobbly MacDonald was now standing at her gate. Mrs. Williams, hello there, Mrs. Williams. Should she pretend to have gone deaf? <laughs> yes. Taking a good grip of the stem with both hands and feet braced for the effort, she closed her eyes for the big tug. Hello there, Mrs. Williams. That's a lovely lilac you've got there. Can I, can I help you at all? The bush came out more easily than she'd expected. Almost first pull, making her stagger a couple of steps backwards. So she threw it to one side and picked up the spade again. Oh, you really should be resting in weather like this, Mrs. Williams. What are you doing? And before she could stop herself, she replied, Digging my fucking grave. At my age, what the fuck else would I be doing? And when she next looked up, the McDonald had gone. <laughs> Indoors, it was almost dark. She went through to the kitchen to wash her hands and then sat down as the first rumble of thunder sounded. Heavy drops of rain had begun spattering the window and she was feeling a bit tired after all that digging and so she might just have a short nap now while she was in the mood. Thank you. Thank you. Prose, yes.
Norman McCaig used to greet me by saying, not writing prose, I hope, Mr. Gregg. <laughs> and for many years I said, no, no, I don't touch that filthy stuff. And then I got involved in climbing, which meant I had to write a book about it. And then I discovered the pleasure of actually making a living by writing prose. A wee while before his death, Norman McCaig asked me to um, to go fish for him in the Loch of the Green Corrie, which he said was his favourite place in the world. And I finally got round to it, and of course wrote a prose book about it. And it's about how when you spend time in a landscape, it enters into you and you start to kind of enter into it. And I wrote this poem after I'd done the book. It's a kind of apology um, to McKeag. We came to know it a little. It kept its best fish hidden under glassy water, behind silver backing of the long day's clouds. We cast and retrieved over that mirror till the green quarry reflected only three bodies of light emptying and filling themselves. That place hooked us by the heart. We were landed and released. Now something of us reclines among those hills and the chuckle of its water runs among the world. I'm going to do a song now um, with a bit of help from the Magic Band. I wrote this for my dear friend Mal Duff who got me involved in climbing in Scotland and the Himalayas and thus writing prose. I miss him as I miss so many people. Through the night Piled high in the gullies Still we set out at first light Head down through the flurries And we climbed Tower Ridge all that day Topped out in the low sun's last rays And he grinned and we shook hands Hey, nice one, youth It's a short life, but sweet, ain't it the truth? We shared wild nights in Namche Bazaar Song sunsets and bars, lots of bars Heartaches and heartaches and fears Summits, fiascos and tears Now the days grow long and I know From the dark until dawn I must go To clear my head on the mountainside But he's so long gone and we try to ease ourselves up through the days to put our short lives in order and some days are glorious then fade like a climber slips over the border but we climb Tower Ridge all that day Hopped out in the low sun's last rays And he grinned and we shook hands Nice one, youth It's a short life, but it's sweet Ain't it the truth? Aye, it's the truth That's me off then. You should not be surprised. Departure has long been my nature and theme. Surely you did not think this could go on. Words condensing each morning, breath on the chill pane where you stood fingering your name. Or those evenings when caresses like carrier pigeons wheeled down the deepening valley of your heart. Love and farewell. Next time we meet, 
I shall sing of arrival. Thank you very much. You make me feel so young, Jim. You make me feel so young. But I'm not. During lockdown, like everybody else, I'm sure, um, I became obsessed with time. And I also became obsessed with uh, dandelion clocks and trying to carry them home uh, so that I could paint them. So the naming of flowers, this is. May time and I'm on a fool's errand carrying home this bunch of the dandelion clocks Shakespeare called chimney sweepers. And a friend tells me his here and now wee granddaughter calls puffballs. But I'm holding my breath and them this carefully because I want to take them home to try to paint them. Although one breath of wind and in no time I'll be stuck with nothing but a hank of leggy, limp, milky, pee-the-bed stalks topped with baldy wee green buttons. For golden lads and girls all must as chimney sweepers come to dust. On Daisy Hill by the railway bridge, one lone pair of lovers lays in the sun. A little apart from her, he lounges, smoking a slow cigarette and waits, smiling, half watching her weave a bluebell chain that swings 
intricate from her fingers, hangs heavy till she loops it, a coronet upon her nut-brown hair. I'm wondering, is this to be her something blue? She calls out to me, I to her, as folk do in these days of distancing. And she asks me what I'm doing with the dead dandelions. I can hardly believe it when she says she never in all her childhood told the time by a dandelion clock. Golden ga lads and girls all must as chimney sweepers come to dust. She's up to her oxers and oxide daisies, this girl. The ones my mother, Margaret, always called Marguerites, but never without telling me again how my father, writing her, to her from France before Dunkirk or after D-Day, always began his letters, Dear Marguerite, O oh, Mum, who never got to be as old as I am now, Mum, how much I wish today I could ask you, did you ever hear tell of this strange superstition this girl just told me? How a maiden crowned by bluebells can never tell a lie? Golden lads and girls all must, as chimney sweepers come to dust. Um, enough of the romance, a bit of a raunch, I think, to end up with. Can't get my socks on. Can't get my rocks off, but that loss of libido that everybody talks of is yet to kick in. Let's do the salsa geriatrica. It's no sin. There are those, God knows, think it outrage. It's not right. Never ever play their lay lady lay, their Marvin Gaye, nor their Barry White. I say, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, give it a spin. Let's try the salsa geriatrica. It's no sin. Jeepers, creepers, the grim reaper for crying out loud. He's cutting a cruel swathe through the old crowd. He's on the rampage. So what are we going to do with our late middle age? Except the salsa geriatrica. It's no sin. Try it on with some septuagenarians and they go, He's peace. They're like, I'm glad I'm past it. It's a merciful release. Me, I'm like, come on, come on, come on, come on. Get ready, get set, begin. Let's try the salsa geriatrica. It's no sin. Had we but world enough and time. Procrastination where no crime. But unless the whole idea is inappropriate or worse, Risable. Delay is inadvisable at our age. Are we on the same page? <laughs> Guys, are we on the same page? <laughs> what else are we going to do with our late middle age? What are we going to do with it, Brian? What can you still do? I can live, I can love, I can push, I can shove. With my horns and my, my wings, wings and my stabilizer things. things. I can laugh, I can cry, I can why, why, why. With my horns and my wings and my stabilizer things. I can big it, I can jig it, I can dig, dig, dig it. With my horns and my wings and my stabilizer things. Yeehaw. Shall we gang and die in the day? 